Hello. Good afternoon, everybody who's joining in our bursary presentations webinar. I'm going to give people a few minutes to join us in the room. You'll be able to see our speakers here on screen with their um, with their videos on. We've got Sarah, Orla and Jamie, and we will also have Vivian joining us later on. Fantastic. Well, we've already got over 50 people here with us uh, on this Thursday lunchtime. Um, my name's Laura Putt. I've been a board member of the Transport Planning Society for six years. So I've actually stepped down from that role this year, but I have um, carried on being involved and um, running the bursary competition this year. As I see it as a really valuable way for young professionals to have an opportunity to do um, their own piece of research on a topic, you know, it might be outside of their day job, have access to a mentor, um, someone on or related to the Transport Planning Society board, um, and undertake their own piece of research, and on successful completion, receive a um, uh, £500 kind of, uh, well, the bursary, basically, uh, contribution towards the time and, and energy they put into that. And it's really excellent that all four of our finalists from 2022 have joined us today to share um, to share their research with you. So I think we've got a, a steady number of people um, in the room now. I hope you can all um, hear us okay. I can see we've got people joining from Shropshire, from Edinburgh. We've got our eye on the chat, so do feel free to use that um, for any issues you might have or to post or to post questions. Um, and as our speakers uh, present, we'll have approximately 10 minutes for each speaker and time for a, a couple of questions at the end, um, and also hopefully some time for discussion um, after our fourth speaker. So I'll start by introducing Sarah Whelan from SWECO and ask if you would like to take us through your piece of research. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Share my screen. Hi everyone, so for my report I put together a methodology for how to map the ideal location for mobility hub networks and also how to decide the components that should form part of those hubs. So just as an overview, the, the main aim, like I said, was to develop the methodology um, and I did this through uh, data collection. So a mixture of demographic area, uh, data area, uh, transport data, and um, data related to amenities in the area. Um, I put this into mapping software using QGIS and TRAC. Um, and through that, I aim to create some catchment maps, which I could run in several different scenarios to show which one was the most effective. So the map you're seeing here, is the winning scenario showing five mobility hubs and it shows you the uh, walking, cycling and public transport catchment um, in purple, lilac and green. Um, and I should say I used a West Lothian case study. So with this winning scenario, 93% of the West Lothian population were within at least a 20 minute journey by public transport. And in the top corner is the key criteria that I was looking at in terms of um, the amenities I was mapping and the transport links. Um, and these have been broadly brought through from 20 minute neighborhood criteria. So it's things like housing availability, employment, uh, footpaths and cycle routes, transport links, education shops, things like that. So a uh, mobility hub, if anyone's not aware, would be defined as transport infrastructure that has a variety of modes of transport available, but also has a community and placemaking aspect to it. So it's a move away from park and rides 
where there was still the reliance on having a car to get you to edge of town areas and then using a bus to get in. It's about removing that need for the car altogether and enabling people from destination to source to use walking, cycling, cars, um, car share clubs, trams, um, buses, all these sustainable modes of transport. So there's a physical provision required. Um, so that's the amenities that you offer within the hub and the infrastructure around the hub, but there's also a behavioral change aspect to it. So the diagram in the center is showing the combi model for behavior change. So it's showing that in order to shift someone's behavior, they need motivation, capability and opportunity. Uh, and often in regards to transport, all of these often favor the car. So it's about shifting this and making sustainable forms of transport as convenient as possible, making these hubs really informative, really welcoming, um, and like I said, a community space to be as well. Um, and along the bottom are the seven key criteria that through the literature review, I, I narrowed in on, on what you should be looking at when you're designing these hubs. Um, and I'll discuss those um, more in the end. So in terms of policy, mobility hubs have the ability to meet more than just transport policy. They can bring around social inclusion and better connections to employment and education. Um, in terms of climate change, it can improve air quality and pollution levels, um, and it can help make communities more active. So I'll discuss now the case study that I did. So like I said, I used a West Lothian case study um, and West Lothian, for anyone that doesn't know, is a council area in the central belt of Scotland between Edinburgh and Glasgow. It's got a population of around 182,000 people and there's 72,000 jobs in the area. And these are mainly relating to retail, care and industry. Um, I chose this area because I'd recently moved there and I was interested in finding out a bit more about the area and it made site visits easier as well. Um, you can see in the centre is a table of mode share comparisons. So when looking at the Scottish average, the Edinburgh average and Glasgow averages, you can see that West Lothian has a much lower bus patronage level and a far higher car patronage level. Um, and when you look at a comparison um, of how long it would take to travel between Edinburgh and Bathgate, which is a town within West Lothian, by car, it's about half an hour, 50 minutes if the traffic was really bad. Um, by train, it's 28 minutes, but by bus, it's 90 minutes. So you can see very quickly that people have to weigh up a decision between um, paying for the journey with their time or financially paying more for a car or train journey to get them there quicker. Um, and on the far side is two catchment maps. Um, using a central point in West Lothian showing how far you can get within 60 minutes by bus at the top and how far you can get within 60 minutes by train at the bottom. Um, so it's just really encouraging to see that bus coverage is, is very dense and you can cover all the major towns throughout West Lothian, but you can't get very far out of West Lothian. And then looking at the train catchments, there's um, rough coverage throughout West Lothian, but you can get right into Edinburgh, Glasgow, Falkirk and, and Stirling to the north as well. So it was this that made it quite an interesting area for a mobility hub, because there is the opportunity for that really local journey aspect to it, but also to cover the vast majority of the central belt as well. And with West Lothian, a lot of the transport um, is east-west centric. You've got two motorways, three train lines and several bus routes all of which are running east to west between Edinburgh and Glasgow. So it makes tra travel north and south, so up to Stirling, over to Fife, or south into England, difficult. And that's whether you're driving by car or public transport. So to start with um, on the project, I um, zeroed in on seven criteria that I wanted in terms of the amenities I'd map. So this was primary schools, high schools, supermarkets, GPs, pharmacies, green space and sport and leisure. And I mapped all of these that were located within West Lothian and loaded that into QGIS. And that enabled me to create an accessible zone for the existing scenario. And that's what you can see in this map at the bottom. So that's all areas that have at least one of each of the seven criteria within 20 minutes travel by bus. 
Um, so on top of that, I then loaded in demographic data, looking at the health of people in the area, their access to a car, areas of multiple deprivation, population density and amenity density. Um, and that enabled me to have several maps layered on top of each other, which I then snipped to highlight areas where all criteria were covered in one area. Um, so off the back of that, there was then seven towns that stood out, which had all seven criteria within 20 minutes by public transport and also had um, low levels of access to a car, uh, high levels of deprivation, high population density, high immunity density and um, poor or very poor health of the area. So I felt choosing towns that had these characteristics um, would show our audience that would benefit most from more accessible, more affordable and more enjoyable sustainable travel options. And just along the top of that table showing uh, a comparison between how much of the population is within the 20 minute public catchment of each of the um, amenity types, comparing the general population of West Lothian to the population without access to a car. And you can see those without access to a car have better accessibility across all the criteria. So I then ran with scenarios. So if I was doing this for a, a real client or a job, I would run several more scenarios. But for this case, I just ran two. So one was looking at improving north-south links. As I said, at the moment, it's very east-west centric. And the second was looking at micro-mobility connections. So this was looking at areas that had really good public transport connections, but were missing perhaps those last miles and would benefit from a mobility hub that had um, active travel provision, micro-mobility, things like this. So like I said, I started with the mapping analysis and then I moved on to the hub design once I had those seven areas I was looking at. So I was looking at the type of hub and I created some tables to help decide the type of hub that would be most appropriate. So whether it be a, a small micro hub or a large nucleus hub, and that depended on the amenities in the area, the need of the community, um, and whether it was a residential area or more of a shopping employment area. Um, I also looked at service promotion. So again, a table where it highlighted the type of services which should be included at each mobility hub, depending on what it had available in the area. So somewhere with a train station and a bus stop wouldn't be an ideal area for demand responsive transport. And then somewhere with 60 mile per hour roads and no cycle infrastructure, I wouldn't be promoting a cycle stand in that area. So that helped me design each hub. And then I moved on to 20 minute analysis. So once I had all the hub locations, I mapped them out to show which of the 17 20 minute criteria were within 10 minutes walk and cycle. And I wanted all 17 to be within these catchments. So if they weren't, I'd slightly move the hub um, to make sure that each hub was, was really accessible. And then the last stage was the catchment mapping. So like I said, the winning scenario was the one with the north-south links. So you can see a map here just showing where I proposed each of the five mobility hubs to be located. And again, it shows you the percentage of the population that were within that catchment. And then just off to the side is uh, an example layout of the design that I had proposed for one of the ones which was going to be at the designer outlet in Livingston. So I mentioned at the beginning that I'd come up with uh, seven criteria to look at. So as well as mobility hubs being about transport, it's also about making a community centred place and a sustainable spot in itself. So looking at things like the amenities that should be there, the demographics of the area and how the transport amenities and placemaking measures can be tailored to different needs. Um, the energy use of the area, so looking at using renewables or having um, charging spaces for buses on the network if they are electric. Um, information availability was really important, making sure that using these hubs was really intuitive and accessible to people, regardless of if they had a learning disability or a physical disability, they could get all the information they needed. And also collaboration. So my example looked just at a West Lothian network. Um, but if it was a real project, I'd be really keen to include the surrounding councils because people are unlikely to live and work within 
the same council area. They often will cross over into the city of Edinburgh through to Glasgow, up to Falkirk Council. So making sure there's continuity in design across these would be really important. So just in summary, um, I put together the methodology so that there would be a, a consistent approach to designing these mobility hubs as they work best as part of a network, a coherent network, and allow people to enjoy using sustainable modes of transport rather than being seen as inconvenient and the car being the primary mode of choice if people have that choice to make. Um, I hope it has been of interest and um, I would just highly recommend taking part in, in the barstery scheme. I really enjoyed it and I really enjoyed having a mentor who was separate from my normal work and who had different views and input to share with me. So it was a really great experience. Thank you ever so much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed, I actually uh, saw your presentation, of course, when you presented to the judging panel back in January, but was really impressed how you pulled together so many different bits of information and um, the kind of presented that as simply as possible um, through the mapping approach you've taken. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the Q&A box, but I wanted to ask, um, I should have said at the start, hopefully um, people know that the theme for the overall bursaries was oh, yeah. on buses and how to ensure they take their rightful place as a key player in the UK's mm. public transport network. And I wondered through your research, had you had many conversations or seen data that was asking people to kind of trade off buses versus the other um, kind of provision that you would expect to see at a mobility hub, whether you mentioned cycle parking or access to uh, tram or metro. I wondered about the, the role of buses specifically. Yeah, so I, I think it's really important that they are part of the mix. I don't think a mobility hub works if it's just buses, you end up just with bus stops. So having the combination and making sure that um, bus providers are included in the conversations so that um, their provision can align really nicely with say train times coming in, uh, work and education start and end times, um, and as well having discussions about things like having bikes on buses um, and accessibility to the buses, I think it's really important. But um, no, throughout the, the research I did, there was never a kind of um, scaling of what was the most important mode to have. It, it seemed to really keep recurring that it was, it was the mixture that was important. Absolutely, yes, and that makes a lot of sense and your point about, you don't want it just to be about transport, but accessing services and opportunities mm -hmm. as well. Um, we've got a, a question from, um, oh, it's disappeared now. Well, I will, I think with um, my eye on the time, say we've got plenty of time for questions uh, later on when we'll bring the panel back together. So if we could move on to, um, oh, hang on, sorry. We've got one question here from John Cara Atko, who asks, do you think it is advantageous to have other facilities at hubs, for example, a convenience store? Mm. Oh, absolutely. I, I would say that that's what I was trying to do with the community mapping to make sure that other services were really close by, but also having things like perhaps community cafes and um, bike hubs and um, even just a sheltered space where communities can have um, events, see a walking group can meet there, things like that. I think that's really important that it is, isn't just about transport, it becomes almost like a community centre. Thank you. And, and a question from Perry about how intuitive is using track with QGIS? QGIS? Mm. So they are separate programs. So there's quite a lot of um, downloading shape files and installing them um, back into QGIS. So it's not a 100% streamlined approach, um, but they do, they do speak well with each other. Um, there is options, I believe, within QGIS to do the catchment mapping directly within there if that's preferred. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for sharing. Um, and we'll, um, yes, get you all back together at the end. So I will next invite Orla Lenehan from Transport for Wales to uh, present her research on ensuring public transport is back in business. Thanks, Laura. I'll just Thanks, Laura. share my screen. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my paper was titled Ensuring Public Transport is Back in Business, the pivotal role buses can play in tackling current and future challenges 
and it was based in the South East Wales case study area. For those who aren't familiar with the case study area, um, for the purpose of this study, um, South East Wales is defined as the Cardiff Capital Region, which is a city region in Wales. And it is shown on the map on the right here. And it comprises the 10 local authorities shown on the left. It has a population of approximately 1.5 million, with Cardiff unsurprisingly being the most po densely populated and Monmouthshire is the least densely populated. So I'll get straight into the methodology. So the methods I used as part of this study, uh, the predominant method was an online survey. Um, this was undertaken in order to ascertain people's perceptions and travel patterns on buses in the South East Wales region. Uh, the survey comprised of a mixture of closed and open questions and responses were collected during October and November 2022. And it was open to individuals over the age of 18 living in the South East Wales area. And there's just a snapshot of the survey there. So in order to attract a high response rate, the survey was shared through a number of different channels and platforms, including community town and parish councils, um, various social media, large employers in the region, including Transport for Wales, uh, volunteering groups and other groups and networks in the region as well. And a large amount of responses were received. There were 648 valued responses received in total. Uh, this graph on the left just shows the breakdown of responses by county. And this is then compared to the graph on the right, which shows the composition of the region by population. Whilst it's not an exact match, for example, Caerphilly and Ronakun and Taft both have five percentage points lower than the proportion of the population, it is considered to be representative of the population of the region. Other methods I used for data collection were a semi-structured interview, which was conducted with a group of adults with learning disabilities based in Rondekin and Taff. And also secondary data was used to supplement the primary data collection, including work undertaken by the University of South Wales on the impact COVID has had on bus services. So on to the interesting part, hopefully, um, data analysis and research findings. So this research project aimed to ascertain the impact the pandemic has had on bus ridership in South East Wales. So online survey participants were therefore asked if they believe they use the bus more or less now compared to before the pandemic. And that is what's shown on the graph on the right here. So 59% stated that they use the bus about the same. 12% stated that they use the bus more now than before COVID. And some of the reasons um, that were cited for this include the rising cost of fuel and the rising cost of owning a car. 28% of respondents say they use the bus less now. And some of the reasons given um, in the open-ended question were um, no longer needing to commute due to working from home. Um, they didn't think the bus was as safe as um, before COVID-19. Um, and also service frequency in people's areas had declined, as well as the number of buses being reduced. So on these two latter points, of those that stated they now use the bus less, 28% of respondents gave reasons referring to a reduction of bus services or frequency in their area since the pandemic. The Wales Institute of Social and Economic Research and Data, or WISER for short, and the University of South Wales investigated how the pandemic has affected bus service levels across Wales. So they took data on Welsh bus services and on public transport infrastructure and compared it from August 2019 to August 2021. And the results were on screen. So it showed there was a loss of 690 bus stops in Wales, which is around 3% of the total. There were 150 fewer bus routes and the service frequencies on the remaining bus routes declined by 22%. They also made a Welsh access to bus indicator, similar to a Scottish access for bus indicator, which basically calculated the access to bus on an LSOA level. And the graph on the right here shows the change in access score from 2019 to 2021. Most LSOAs, both rural and urban, urban, saw a net decline in bus services and um, areas in the study area, including um, areas in Newport, Central Cardiff, 
uh, Vale of Glamorgan, South Monmouthshire, all saw a decrease of more than 50% in their access to bus score. The level of service provision and access to buses was also measured then against the Welsh Index of Multiple Deprivation, as shown on the graph on the right. So the darker green shows the medium Welsh access to bus indicator score for 2019, the lighter is 2021, and then along the y-axis is the Welsh Index of Multiple Deprivation decile, with one being the most deprived and 10 being the least deprived. So as can be seen, the largest decrease in access score was seen in the most deprived areas of Wales, which suggests that these areas experienced the greatest loss of bus services over this period. Factors affecting bus travel. So response to the online survey were also asked to complete a stated preference question to ascertain what factors might influence mode shift to bus in the future. And this graph just shows a summary of their respondents. So if we look at the red, which shows decreased use of bus, 2.3% stated that app-based booking and solely app-based booking would dec decrease the amount they use the bus in future. So they wanted to have the option to pay on the bus or um, in cash or card. Interestingly, cheaper fares um, didn't have the largest impact on bus use, um, or it's quite interesting to me. I did go into this thinking that would be the defining factor, um, but 30% stated it would have no impact on their bus use in the future. 70% of respondents said that improved bus stop infrastructure would slightly or largely increase their use of bus. Response of the online survey were also asked to give um, an other option. So if there were any other factors um, that might affect uh, their ridership of buses and 3% of respondents identified issues with driver attitudes or customer service of drivers. Um, the reason I'm highlighting this is because this was also raised in the semi-structured interview I did with the group of adults with learning disabilities from Ronda Kananta. The group stated that bus drivers need additional training on how to be inclusive to people with both physical and hidden disabilities. And they acknowledged it was, of course, not all drivers, but the ones that maybe did come across rude or unwelcoming did deter them from using the bus in the future. Of the respondents that completed the open ended question, 10% of respondents mentioned that bus services are poor or do not exist in the evening. And some of these written responses are highlighted below. They include a disproportionate impact on the young, so under 18s potentially, who can't necessarily drive, but might work in, for example, out of town shopping centres such as Crib Causeway and rely on the bus to get there. Um, others said that they just can't get to work by bus because of their shift times. And one user said that unreliability or non-existence of late night buses is the main barrier to usage. So what were the factors that, according to this survey, have the greatest impact in increasing bus use in the future? More direct services would see the largest increase in bus ridership, according to this survey. Better integration between bus services. So if you have to get more than one bus service, the integration in terms of location and also timetables matching up would also play a part. More frequent services and better integration between modes, including rail, active travel. So to summarise, this study represents a large scale study into the factors that influence bus ridership with 648 responses received from across the South Wales region. The factors that had the largest impact in increasing use of buses were more direct services, more frequent services, better integration between bus services and better integration between modes. And some of the recommendations that came out of this study. For wellbeing and social inclusion reasons, sufficient bus services must be made available to those who need them most. So for those who maybe don't have a car or van available to them or for other reasons. In order to achieve mode share targets, bus services need to be available to as many people as possible. Large scale driver recruitment is important, but so is training and education as well. App based booking should not replace cash payments, but should be a part of the overall ticketing offer. And finally, bus stop infrastructure needs to be improved, standardised, yet applicable to the location. 
and thank you for listening. Thank you ever so much, Ola. It's a lot of content to get through in a short time. So thank you for taking us through that. It was um, quite shocking for me to see how uh, closely the kind of reduction in bus services um, in kind of areas of highest deprivation, you know, that relationship and whether um, the people making those decisions had kind of taken that into account in any kind of um, equalities impact assessment in advance, I don't know. Um, if you know, but it's quite a, a disappointing picture. And um, we've got a couple of questions um, here in the Q&A. So Chris Todd has asked about the sampling, the survey that you conducted and why you chose the age cutoff of 18. He says this could exclude a potentially large market of bus users as most will not yet have access to a car. I completely agree. It was more from an ethical point of view. If you involve under 18s in the survey, you have to go through, there's all sorts to do with ethics. Um, so just for ease and because we were in quite a tight time scale with doing um, this study, I just chose to keep it easier for myself, if I'm honest, to keep it over 18. But you're absolutely right. And as I mentioned, um, it can, the lack of bus services, especially in the evening, can have a disproportionate effect on those 16 to 18 bracket who might not necessarily be able to drive yet, but do rely on the car to get to jobs in retail hospitality. Um, so I completely agree. Um, if I were to repeat it and if I could get the necessary ethic um, approvals, I would definitely look at including them. Thank you. And a question from Rupert Biggin, um, who asks, um, we, tend, we frequently hear still that ridership hasn't recovered versus pre-COVID as a justification for cutting bus services. Does your research support the reverse, i.e. reduced bus services results in reduced ridership? I think so completely. I think even the in my research where it showed the factors that influence bus use, it wasn't... Um, as I say, I went into it thinking cheap affairs, money would make people want to use a bus more, but it wasn't. It was more frequent services, more direct services would make them use a the bus more. And what came up repeatedly during my research was people used to use a bus before COVID because the services were there, services have been cut. It's been made more difficult for them to get the bus. And even some to a point, if services were reinstated, they're now in the habit of not using a bus because the services were taken away. So completely, um, my research has shown that put the bus services on, people will come, um, I think is the answer. Superb, thank you, Orla. Um, I would now like to invite Vivian Elby, who works at Leeds City Council, to present on us his research on back on course, how to level up buses and enhance transport options for everyone. Thank you, Vivian. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Laura, for the introduction. So, yeah, so I, I, I'm here today from Leeds City Council. Um, sorry, and just... sorry to interrupt, Vivian. If you are able to just go back to slide one, we are seeing slide five at present. Oh, yeah, sorry. In, I'm... in a presenter mode. Lovely. Um, there we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, OK. Yeah, hopefully no more, no, no more hiccups. So... Um, yes, yeah, so, so like the, the other Bessarians, I was trying to answer the question of um, how do we ensure um, buses take the rightful place in the UK's transport network? So really, I suppose my theme that I tried to look at was um, to tie into the, the wider levelling up agenda that, that's been relevant over the last few years. And I think that's sort of particularly apt for the bus sector is... Um, um, since deregulation, or to put things another way, before deregulation, the metropolitan areas outside of London had higher bus ridership than, than London. But of course, that's very different today. There's a much, um, much, much higher bus use in, in London and, and much um, slimmed down and uh, reduced networks outside of London. So, um, but the way I went about this um, for for the for the um, paper was essentially I conducted ten sort of in depth interviews with key figures across the bus sectors. Um, most of those in in sort of policy roles um, in in different different places, 
um, but also in, in, in bus operations. And then that allowed me to build up case studies in, in the paper that informed the four key themes of the competition, which were sort of um, post-COVID recovery, um, the concurrent cost of living crisis and climate crisis, and then the question of how to tackle inequality in amongst of all of that. And I think really, um, I think my paper tried, tried to argue quite strongly that no other mode other than the bus can really produce the same scale of benefit that, that a bus alone can. And then going through these um, interviews and my research allowed me ultimately to, to draw out some recommendations. But I think today um, I just, I'm just going to talk briefly about a, a couple of um, case studies I did look at, um, just a, a snippet of, of two, and then I'll, I'll share some reflections on the competition as a whole. So I think, um, yeah, I think I, I felt quite lucky to um, be able to speak to a, a couple of people from Dublin at the uh, National Travel Authority. Um, and I think what's really interesting about Dublin is they've kind of kind of gone back to sort of first principles and really tried to redesign their net, um, bus network. Um, I mean, lots of places obviously invest in, in bus priority and there's examples of bus priority schemes all, all throughout um, um, the British Isles. But um, I think I think what how Dublin stands out is that they've been willing to really um, re-examine the whole network, re-examine the principles principles behind um, what makes a bus network and, and what the or a public transport network and and, and what principles um, will ultimately lead to the most effective. Um, network. So they, they've they employed Jarrett Walker Associates and, and some people on the call might be aware of Jarrett Walker. He, he, he has a, a blog called Human Transit that's also a, a book. Um, but I think this was Jarrett Walker's Associates sort of first um, commission outside of the North American context, which which sort of added um, interest as well in, in, in um, their, their work in Dublin. Um, so, 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 what, what, what did they really try and do? I, I, I think, I think, um, yeah, the the quote here is really trying to is probably one of the, the key things that Jarrett Walker tries to um, get across to people that um, that yeah, there's always a geo. We might want to geographically serve every last street and give every last person a direct bus service to where they want to go, but that, that really doesn't work. We, we, we've got to make some hard choices um, between ridership essentially and geographic coverage. And I think what um, Dublin have, have, have really tried to do is, is, yeah, really consult with the public in Dublin on these, on, on an idea of reshaping the network to have very high frequency spine routes and very high frequency orbital routes, which ultimately means um, as on the picture on the right, we end up with less routes overall, but a much um, a network that actually works much better for everyone. But ultimately, I think that the lesson from Dublin is that change is both very hard and very expensive. And I think what that meant was um, consultations show that even when people had a bus that was only once every two hours, you know, it went all around the houses, but it went directly to the centre, people really didn't want to lose what they already had. So that's what made change very hard because uh, there was a lot of pushback against the the idea of um, changing to a system which works better as a system, but requires a lot more interchanges. And then I think the other thing is um, to sort of, they, they have gone ahead and, and actually implemented a lot, a lot of um, new orbital routes, um, but because they've kind of had to um, maybe scale down some of the ambition in terms of like the overall network redesign that that's added to the cost of the whole project. But um, but ultimately, I think um, initial signs um, from Dublin are really encouraging. Like bus patronage has already um, bounced back from um, below COVID numbers to now I think be at one hundred one percent. So it seems um, yeah. 
there is a lesson from Dublin, although change is both hard and expensive, it seems early signs are that it can deliver results. And then the other thing I'll just uh, touch on is one of the things I was interested in looking at is, is yeah, getting into the nitty gritty of, of the operational ele elements. So um, I did some research with a colleague here at the council and we, we came up with an estimate based on um, <clears throat> crunching the, uh, what's called the, uh, uh, the real time bus data that it seems in, in, in Leeds, we have an average time that buses dwell at each stop of 33 seconds, which is almost sort of triple the number um, achieved by TfL. So that, that's, that's a concern that we're, we're essentially, um, yeah, lo losing so much time and so much inefficiency and probably, um, yeah, our, our cost of operation here in Leeds is presumably a lot higher and our passenger experience is a lot worse because um, we're spending a lot more time um, seeing the bus uh, dwelling rather than getting us to where we need to be. So, um, but I think overall, the, the conclusion here is probably that um, lots of people at the moment across the country are looking at um, what they can achieve with either an enhanced partnership or a, a franchise system. But it's probably the case that no matter what um, um, what, what what's decided there, uh, um, some, some, some places are going to decide an enhanced partnership is better for them. Some places will, um, like Manchester, decide that franchising is better. But um, yeah, the, 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 the key thing across ev everything is buses need to be moving as, as swiftly as possible. Um, and then, yeah, I just, just to wrap up, um, um, I just wanted to talk about um, what, what the experience of the bursary competition was like for anyone interested in um, uh, potentially applying this year. So I, I, I would really strongly recommend it. I think one of the things that was really valuable for me was it gave me a chance to really focus in on buses, um, which isn't part of my day job. Here, here at sort of Leeds City Council, we're a highways authority, not a transport authority. So it's the West Yorkshire Combined Authority above us who, who have a responsibility for public transport, whereas I'm normally more working on active travel. So it was really, I, I really enjoyed, um, yeah, focusing on this, you know, and the um, having a project that was really not like the day job. Um, and I think the, the really key part of the um, opportunity for me was, was, yeah, speaking to so many key figures in transport and getting them to sort of elucidate and share their expertise on matters that I'd done some research on, but they were able to really, um, yeah, bring that to life in a way that I wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. Um, and then just one tip. Um, I think I, I, I chose a very, very broad theme, I think, but um, I, I think, yeah, a more narrow focus could potentially allow one to get more out of the process. And then I think, my, my, yeah, my other reflection actually is, um, when I put in my application, that must have been this time last year, I think I was sort of between projects and I probably at that time imagined I would have plenty of time to work on the bursary competition. But then a few months later, when it came to do the bursary, I'd started um, doing a master's course in transport part time. So I, I, that was really no longer the case. So, again, that might be a, a good reason to if you are thinking of applying, maybe to sort of hone in on, on a niche. But um, I, I do want to sort of reassure that the, the support from your, your mentor is really, really helpful to keep you on track with the competition. So yeah, overall, I'm just confident anyone would uh, find the uh, TPS bursary experience really worthwhile. Thank you so much, Vivian. And you've put that much more eloquently than, than I could have. So thank you for sharing your experience of taking part in the competition and presenting your research. And I think you could, all hopefully in the audience see already from our first three speakers kind of the wide range of different directions people were able to take the topic on you know buses having their taking their rightful place in the public transport network and some people choosing to undertake their own um, primary research um, talking to people through interviews or uh, focusing more on kind of technical or GIS analysis um, so yes really kind of wide ranging opportunity for which direction you would want to take the work 
Um, we've got quite a few uh, questions, <clears throat> excuse me, Vivian, and um, a couple relating to um, kind of the double door uh, on buses in, in London question and, and whether partly the difference in dwell times could also be related to the ticketing um, systems in place and perhaps the fact that buses in London um, are more frequent, so maybe they're picking up or dropping off uh, fewer passengers each time. Um, and a related question on whether there's any other trade-offs or things you uh, needed to think about in terms of double door buses and, and the space that's made available, then flexible space for wheelchairs or buggies or impact on revenue collection. Yeah, you know, I think they're all, all really good questions. I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think on the on ticketing, I think that that is um, a, a, a key point. I mean, that is going to play a part in it, and maybe may, perhaps a better statistic, or would be to sort of yeah get to the bottom of what's the split that's to do with double doors and what's the split that's to do with ticketing. I mean, I think um, I think someone from TfL probably quite rightly pointed out that in, in London there's a lot more sort of churn at each stop of people getting on and off, whereas out in the provinces sometimes it's everyone goes into the centre at the same time, so you don't have the same degree of churn. Um, so, 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 so that yeah, th th there's there's a there's there's a, a, a um, yeah different things that are going to factor in. Um, and then, yeah, I think I think actually the point on the amount of space available that that's that's really interesting too because I know that double door buses are, are quite unusual outside of London, but I think um, yeah that that that's obviously a concern. I think the one route in in London that notably doesn't use double doors is, is a service to the to the to Heathrow from Croydon, so that that obviously needs the space downstairs for extra luggage. Um, and again, I think it is a concern for people, um, bus operators elsewhere. Um, yeah, how, how much value do you place on having as much space as possible for um, mobility devices of all, all sort? And how much do you place on uh, the speed of people getting on and off? So yeah, it, it, there's a lot of trade-offs. Thank you, Vivian. Um, conscious of the time, I'm going to invite uh, Jamie to um, share his research with us and hopefully we might get to some of the questions later or they are in the chat and the presenters might be able to come back and type an answer to those. And um, so Vivian, if you take a look at the chat and the Q&A, there's quite a few questions there for you. But I'd like to welcome Jamie Smith, who won our bursary competition in 2022 and also won the um, best paper by a young professional at the Transport Practitioners Meeting last week, um, where it was really good to meet you in person, and you were presenting um, this piece of research there. So again, an opportunity to kind of share um, the work you might do for a, a piece of bursary research more widely. So Jamie works at Arup and is presenting on changing the parameters of community transport to deliver greater economic and social value to rural areas across the UK. Thanks, Jamie. Great. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, so yeah, um, thanks Laura. So yeah, afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie Smith. I'm a transport planner at Arup. Uh, I'll actually put that back. Apologies. Uh, I'll just have to reshare, I think. Uh, okay. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so yeah, afternoon everyone. I'm Jamie, a transport planner at Arup based in Scotland and today I'm delighted to present my paper which is all about community transport uh, community transport and the economic and social value of community transport uh, that could potentially bring to rural areas across the UK. Um, so just to provide a bit of an introduction into the sort of key issues around uh, this topic area which prompted me into this research. So uh, firstly there, there are many sort of geographic barriers in, in rural areas such as uh, you know, distances, smaller populations and population sparsity, which make uh, operating a traditional public transport network that's economically viable, it makes that very challenging. Uh, that leads to poor public transport uh, in rural areas, uh, contributing to uh, limited transport options uh, for local people, leading to issues like you know, forced car ownership, so people owning a car who can't really afford one. 
um, and also wider is issues for society like isolation uh, and also transport poverty and, and linked to that fuel poverty as well. Um, and also, you know, considering challenges like the cost of living crisis, uh, COVID-19 and climate change, uh, for me, uh, public transport in rural areas uh, requires a significant rethink uh, to prov provide that greater economic and social value um, in rural areas, particularly in the current climate where, you know, everyone's looking for value uh, with, you know, the current economic uh, situation that we're all in. And I thought it'd be worth providing a, a bit of a definition for community transport as well. Um, and for me, this, this proves that community transport could play a key role uh, in tackling a, a lot of the key issues that have been identified above. So, um, you know, it's all about flexibility, accessibility, uh, and meeting unmet transport needs. Um, so in terms of the aims and objectives of this research, um, I wanted to explore how community transport could be adapted to deliver greater economic and social value to rural areas across the, the UK. Um, my objectives, so first I wanted to understand the current situation in terms of uh, transport and bus services in rural areas. I also wanted to explore the CT sector and existing facilities across the UK. And probably the most important one, number three, uh, which was to identify challenges, opportunities and solutions for key stakeholders uh, to ensure CT uh, delivers uh, greater economic and, and social outcomes. You know, I, I very much wanted this research to be a sort of solutions-led uh, piece of work that key stakeholders could potentially benefit from. Um, so moving on to my methodology. Um, so I started off with a targeted uh, literature and policy review where I looked at national policy uh, and legislation where uh, we're relevant uh, across all devolved nations in the UK. Uh, that was then supplemented by um, a literature review of uh, best practice uh, within the UK and also across Europe as well in relation to rural transport and community transport. Uh, that provided the base for the engagement stage, uh, which consisted of uh, technical workshops, uh, firstly with my local transport planning team um, at Arup in the north, uh, and also the, the UK-wide uh, bus and coach skills group within Arup as well, uh, which provided some really good insights. Uh, I also undertook interviews and discussions with a number of key stakeholders, uh, one being the Community Transport Association uh, in the UK, also the Department for Transport, Transport Scotland, uh, and a number of local authorities um, across the, the devolved nations across the UK. That all came together uh, to form a, a Community Transport Action Plan, uh, which uh, provides potential solutions to, to many of the issues that were identified uh, throughout the research. So the remainder of my presentation is going to uh, summarise the, the key findings uh, from my research. Um, so the literature and policy review Firstly, probably the main finding, and probably an unsurprising one, is that rural populations currently suffer from high private car dependency, uh, which is caused by uh, population sparsity and a lack of transport options. Uh, this is combined with a decline in bus services across the UK, caused by a number of issues that have been touched on through pre previous presentations throughout the session as well. Uh, you know, deregulation, austerity, uh, and more recently, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in terms of community transport, uh, the solutions could be, you know, community-led bus services, uh, DRT, and also more informal arrangements that can be found in, in rural, very remote rural areas, like, you know, for example, the islands in Scotland. Um, in terms of the economic and social value of CT, this isn't widely recognised and there isn't a lot of research out there, apart from uh, work that was undertaken by the Ealing Community Transport Charity in Deloitte in 2016, which basically looks at the, uh, monetizing the economic value of community transport uh, for the health and social care sector. Uh, and also good practice in terms of, of CT can be found from countries like Germany, the Netherlands and Luxembourg with a wide range of different models uh, that appear to be successful. Uh, the technical workshops, so these were, were really useful. Uh, I got a wide range of perspectives, um, you know, in terms of public transport and rural transport as well. Um, so there were a number of issues that were identified, uh, limited route options, low demand, um, low service frequencies and aging fleets um, within rural areas. There was also a consensus that uh, across both workshops that you know, fixed service operating models um, in isolation 
don't really work in rural areas. Um, you know, they don't take people where they want to go. Um, you know, they, they don't cater for demand in rural areas. So that requires a significant rethink in, in how public transport as a network is, is planned out. Um, opportunities may include resource sharing uh, with other sectors. An example that was cited was the post bus um, that was uh, used to be in operation across the UK, where if uh, you know uh, parcels and, and uh, etc. were being delivered to remote areas of the UK, that vehicle that was undertaking that trip could potentially double up as uh, a community bus service. Uh, but unfortunately, they aren't in operation anymore in the UK because of, of changes to legislation. Um, and there also could be an opportunity as well to empower rural communities uh, by giving them a role in, in the planning and, and running of services. Um, so interviews and discussions, uh, there was a lot to, to take in from these discussions, as you can probably imagine. Uh, so I've tried to summarise these in, in the most user-friendly way possible. Um, so the main issue was probably around funding uh, in relation to community transport. These are often you know, short-term uh, one-off payments. Uh, that CT organisations have to apply for. Um, also bus driver shortages. Uh, the main issue that was raised in relation to this was the requirement for a D1 licence to drive a minibus. So anyone who obtained their driving licence post-1997 has to apply for the D1 aspect of, the, of their licence, uh, which is often, you know, you have to uh, pass the test, uh, you have to pay for it, uh, and it's often a, a sort of a long process to, to do that which naturally leads to a reliance on people who already have the D1 uh, license as part of their, uh, you know, their driving license, which is um, you know, a small pool, pool of people and, and potential over-reliance on, on older drivers. Uh, other issues, high operating costs, uh, negative public and political perceptions, um, and also opportunities that, that were discussed as well, where you know, opportunities to encourage more young people into the sector. Um, opportunities to quantify the, the value that services provide to really sort of get decision makers excited about the prospect of, of investing in community transport um, you know, as a mode of transport in, in a way, as a solution in, in rural environments uh, and also an opportunity to revisit current legislation uh, as well. Um, so the, this all came together to form my community transport action plan. Uh, which was split into four key themes, uh, which I will discuss just now. Um, I'm just conscious of time, I won't dwell on these too much, but um, you know, the key point in terms of policy and legislation was probably around the, the National Community Transport Strategy, which, uh, which should be done alongside the CTA and uh, you know, should provide a clear direction for community transport across the UK. Uh, and also there should be, you know, uh, we should exercise uh, you know, legislation to give local authorities more powers uh, to provide their own services uh, and also revisit uh, the, the Section 19 and Section 22 permit system to potentially uh, simplify and expand um, you know, that system. Uh, also existing services, so like I discussed previously, you know, quantifying the, the economic and social value of community transport, uh, using the Ealing example as a template, and also a really important one probably for all that all local authorities should be, be considering and probably doing as a sort of ongoing action, if you like, um, you know, reviewing their, their CT providers and considering ways of, of supporting them. And uh, that's very much a sort of ongoing action, I think. Uh, operation and funding. Uh, so empowering communities to, to plan CT services with support from local authorities in terms of, you know, tendering and, um, you know, admin support in the background. Uh, streamlining national funding sources uh, and also an interesting one is a uh, you know partnership working with the private sector this could be a great way of you know ensuring you know community and key stakeholder buy-in uh, to you know improve it, improving community transport as a as a mode of transport uh, and finally promotional behavioral change and um, so awareness of ct as a mode of transport and um, to really sort of change the perceptions of community transport uh, as a mode of transport and also campaigns to encourage greater diversity of people within the sector uh, to volunteer and also pursue a career in the sector. This is really important for the long-term sustainability and resilience of the sector moving forward. So just to, to sort of wrap up uh, in conclusion, for me, I feel like there are key aspects of community transport that should be adapted to deliver better outcomes uh, for rural areas. I also feel like CT would reach its highest potential as if it operated as demand responsive, 
which avoids the, the operation of you know highly sort of subsidised fixed bus services. And a very important point as well is we're not going to solve all these issues just through investing in community transport. Community transport is only part of the solution. It should be considered alongside uh, rural mobility hubs and also digital technology as well, like mobility as a service. Uh, and just finally, I very much hope that my action plan has provided a, a something that could be of use to the sector moving forward. Uh, like I said at the start, I wanted this to be a sort of solutions-led approach, and I very much hope that this provides a framework for uh, delivering better outcomes through community transport uh, in rural areas. Uh, so thanks very much for listening. Uh, I've left my contact details here if anyone wants to, to discuss anything, um, discuss any opportunities, um, or keep the conversation going, uh, and also any questions about the bursary competition as well, I'd be happy to uh, to take them as well. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening, and uh, happy to, to take any questions. Thank you ever so much, Jamie. Um, I know some people might have this in their diary for one hour, others seem to have it for 90 minutes, but um, I think obviously for those that need to be somewhere else, um, do of course feel free to move on to where you need to be next but I will um, invite the panelists if you're able to to stay for a further five or ten minutes and um, see if we can tackle some of the questions that have come in, in the Q&A. Um, firstly somebody had asked about whether the reports are going to be made available and I posted in the chat the link to the bursary section on our website as well as the theme for, ne for this year's competition for those that are interested. So Jamie, Sarah, Vivian and all his, um reports are all available on there to download. Um, so there's quite a few questions here for um, Jamie. One here from Andrew um, saying, we've got some good examples of community rail partnerships. Do you think community bus partnerships could replicate their, replicate their success as a way of influencing the design and delivery of PT services? Is there an opportunity to broaden their remit to look at wider mobility services for rural areas? car clubs etc and this might be something that Sarah also wants to, to join in on yeah absolutely yeah I think that's something that definitely should be, be looked at in, in best practice I think that's something that's uh, adopted in um, you know European examples like the Netherlands and, and Germany and things like that as well I also think there's an opportunity to share resources as well you know there's a, a lot about you know sort of value and, and efficiencies at the moment particularly in rural areas I think, I think there's an opportunity to resource share with, you know, different sectors like health and social care. And, um, you know, I mentioned the post bus, you know, delivery services um, and also education as well. So I think that that sort of partnership approach uh, mm. is really important moving forward. Mm. And that links in quite nicely to John's question. And um, would the other speakers like to join us in, in the panel so we can have a little bit more of a discussion for the last few minutes? Thank you very much. Welcome back. Um, so like, will it? feels like, as John has pointed out, and like you talked about there with the post bus services, um, from across all four presentations, um, John Carr has pointed out that transport feels to be undervalued in terms of its social impacts. Is there value in declaring bus routes of all varieties to be community assets, as has been done in rural areas with shops, post offices, and even pubs? So this is picking up on the kind of wider point about buses being part of the mobility hub, not just kind of a, a series of bus stops that Sarah pointed out, um, and whether, um, yes, they, they deserve to be um, community assets. Don't know, Jamie, if you'd like to start, and then if any of the others in the panel would like to join in. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably a good starting point in terms of actually, um, you know, like, like you say, you know, demonstrating the value that these services provide. Um, you know, not just economically in terms of getting people to their work and things like that, but also socially in terms of tackling isolation and things like that. And community transport is a massive way of, of doing that. And I completely agree it is potentially undervalued, which is why one of my actions alongside that one is uh, to quantify the value that community transport provides. I think that's really important to sort of demonstrate to decision makers that uh, the value that these services and also wider bus services as well can can provide as well thank you sarah did you have anything you wanted to add on on that one so i've just been evicted from my room so i'll be back in a second <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, the only thing I would add was uh, when I was doing the literature review, uh, one of the points that kept coming up as well was community involvement helps you know, make these areas successful if they feel like they have a say in how it's um, designed and run, they're more likely to engage with it. So I think, yeah, any way that you can give more people more of a say on how these things are managed, the, the better. 
I think one, one thing I would maybe add as well is the, uh, in rural areas, you know, a lot of these communities are very integrated, you know, everyone knows everyone. So um, there's a lot more sort of pride in, in ownership around these things. So I think that that's something that could particularly work in, in rural areas. And it gives, you know, the community a sense of ownership behind these things as well. Yeah, I think that's a really, sorry, I've, I've decided I will take over from Laura now um, while she's moving rooms. <laughs> Oh, Laura, are you back? Do you want to do it? I'm back, but you're fine, Ruby. Please go ahead. Well, all I was going to say was I feel like this is applicable to um, everyone's presentations, but maybe particularly Orla's was someone made a comment about, Chris Todd made a comment about how rural area characteristics vary massively um, across the country and coming up with any kind of framework approach um, is really difficult for exactly that reason. And I wondered whether anyone had any thoughts on that and how it should be kind of addressed within these kind of approaches that we're talking about, whether that is community transport or other kind of how we deal with bus partnerships. Ola, I kind of mentioned you by name, but I d it doesn't have to be you. <laughs> Sorry, we're struggling to unmute then. Um, yeah, I think it is interesting each area is obviously different has different characteristics different needs different travel patterns as well um i'm actually working on a project at the moment which we're going to cover a large rural area um and look at transport and how to improve transport and not necessarily set up a framework because i just i think it's quite difficult to do that um i mean you need to get down um to the base level um and really get into communities which is obviously difficult from a strategic point of view um yeah i think it was interesting because my survey for example um went to a whole region and you had rural uh urban i collected postcodes and it was a widespread of um like different communities that answered and yet a lot of them were saying similar things in terms of even if it was urban and rural in terms of frequency in terms of services that were kind of these issues on a varying scale, the same issues, um, which I found quite interesting, which came out of my research anyway. Yeah, definitely. Um, Laura, I'm going to hand back over to you because I feel like I've, I've hijacked your chair. <clears throat> no, it's very, a very welcome, welcome intervention. Um, and I noticed uh, we were talking about kind of community uh, support and, and um, yeah, kind of ownership in a way of some of these services, but it does sound like from Mike, uh, Landon, who put a comment in the chat, says he did try hard in the West Midlands to get some community bus partnerships going in the past, but it proved near impossible to get the public involved. So I guess that's a kind of wider challenge of how to um, make these things, you know, manageable and feasible and attractive for people to get involved with and also uh, sustainable. And that links a bit to a, a question from Alan in the Q&A. Um, who's talking about the kind of, um, yes, sustainability of can bus owners and operators survive comfortably in the bus business when their capital costs and operating costs are um, influencing factors in providing sustainable bus business. Um, and I guess just kind of uh, the kind of challenge of, of managing the costs, capex and opex costs, and serving the areas which um, we would ideally like to serve, which again links to uh, some of the questions that came in response to to Vivian's uh, presentations about kind of um, focusing on on ridership on a particular link, maybe a, a kind of high frequency link, um, but at the expense potentially of that kind of wider network, and and whether anyone's got any thoughts or advice from their research on on that. Uh, kind of operating costs and what to focus the provision on. I don't know, Vivian, if you saw in the in the chat the question about could it be possible? Would there be a kind of ride hailing that might um, provide access to a more high frequency kind of bus spine that might serve kind of then that kind of wider network as well as the the kind of core bus routes. In response to um, your example from Dublin. Yeah, so, so I mean, I think that is an um, interesting topic, the subject of sort of demand responsive um, um, services. I mean, um, 
I, I think because I think over the last few years, a lot of demand responsive trials have, have occurred through um, um, different pots of, of money, whether um, better buses fund, rural mobility funds, and um, BSIP. Um, I think I think um, to probably in some ways echo what um, Roger French, who, who writes on that topic quite a lot. Um, yeah, we, we probably need to nationally figure out um, what the best models are for DRT. And I think to go back to the point about different um, rural areas have quite different characteristics. It's probably that marrying up what's the model of DRT that works best in this particular situation, whether it is um, feeding into um, some sort of interchange and yeah, what, what the best way to design design these DRT schemes is it? I, I think because a lot a lot of DRT schemes haven't been successful. I think it's it, it's it's not a universal sort of panacea, and we do really need to yeah. I think think quite carefully about what's the right model for DRT in the right place, and that hopefully hopefully will we'll, that that will come come forward, and we'll we'll learn lessons from the ones which are successful. Thank you ever so much. Now, there's quite a few uh, questions in the chat and in the Q&A, but hopefully our panellists will have a chance to look at them um, after this session and can, can respond um, separately. But thank you ever so much. It's been a really good level of engagement. Lots of good questions coming forward. I know Ruby was going to quickly share on screen the advert for this year's bursary competition for anybody who's interested. Um, the main thing is to say you can find the information on the TPS website. The deadline for abstracts is the 21st of July. Um, and we're looking for examples of transport interventions that have focused on reducing um, environmental damage and how or if that has interacted with poverty or social exclusion. So we're interested in kind of case studies and how transferable those solutions might be to other uh, locations or other problems. And this might be something you've come across in your working life or that you've seen on a holiday or in the area where you live. Um, and hopefully um, between Sarah, Orla, Jamie and Vivian, you've seen, you know, the broad range that your research could go off in and the, the value and the hopefully enjoyment uh, of taking part. So a big thank you to all of our speakers today. Thank you for being here. And I know Joe Ward has left the call, but I also want to do, do a big shout out and thank you to Joe who ran the um, bursary competition for the last few years um, and has been really supportive in, in my taking over the role. So thank you ever so much. And I wish you a very good rest of the day.